Tom here from Lawrence Systems, and security is much more than product, it's people. Everything else is just tools we use to sort out the data. Now, choosing those tools that'll help sort out the data and all the people behind the tools is a complicated topic. And this video is not to take product A and product B and put them together and tell you the ultimate winner and the security solution to all of your security problems like marketing people like to say. I wanna walk through a security incident here that we had on February 12th of 2023. Yes, it was a Sunday. Yes, we responded. And yes, Sunday security incidents suck, but hey, that's when these things happen sometimes. We have to be prepared, we have to be ready. And I want to go through the process. I wanna go through each of the detections, how we dealt with them, how the tools dealt with the detections. And I wanna serve as a data point, not a decision point, just a data point so you can understand some methodologies we use when looking at the tools, when looking at the processes we use to secure our clients. Now, this is not a sales pitch to use any of those tools, but I will disclose, yes, I'm a reseller for both of these products. I want to always make sure my bias towards anything is very upfront and clear. So let's dive into the incident and walk you through what happened and how the response from each company went because there's a lot of nuance in here that I think is very important and it really highlights the complexity of security. Now we buy Huntress direct from Huntress and we buy Sentinel-1, their Vigilance version, through Ninja-1. That means we communicated directly with Huntress for this investigation. We communicated with Ninja-1 to talk to Sentinel-1. So there's a delay in response. I wanna highlight that just so you know that when we talked to Ninja-1, they related to Sentinel-1 who related back to Ninja-1 who related back to us. So there wasn't as much real-time communication as we had through Huntress. And that's basically why, and it's not something that is a Ninja-1 policy per se. This is the way when you buy through a reseller, Sentinel-1 has you communicate through that reseller that you bought it from. So it's not just if you bought it through Ninja One. We previously used to buy it through Pax8 and the same process was followed for that. Now this client is a co-managed client and this co-managed client has partial coverage with us. As in they have an internal IT team and they have decided that they only want us to load our tools on their servers, but not their entire network, not their endpoints and we don't have any visibility into their firewall. We didn't have the password to it. This is a very niche co-managed deal that we have. And this is why we have certain limitations that we're going to hit on how deep we can go with the investigation because we just don't have the extra visibility, but we're going to pull everything that we have to kind of walk you through this. Now this incident is kicked off when we receive a notice report from Huntress that says incident high. This is a threat and Huntress has extremely low false positives. Therefore, when we see a notice from Huntress, we know it's something bad and something we need to address immediately. Now I've redacted some of the information here, but let's zoom into specifically the remediation instructions because that's one of the first focuses is what is it and how do we remediate it? How do we stop this from going further? Because they have the instructions of what to remove and we did follow these instructions and remove these things. They give us some indicators of what it was and a virus total link that kind of leads us down the path of what is this file and what might it be doing? So let's dive deeper into that. So we have our virus total link, which shows 15 out of 70 detections. And here it is, 15 out of 70. And this was actually a file that was seen all the way back in 2022 of 1019 was when the analysis was done in virus total. Bring that forward to February 28th of 2023. We reran this again. And the virus total link, if you want to see it currently, is down in the description below. But now we have the details and a couple more vendors have flagged it. Now, one of the vendors that still hasn't flagged it is Sentinel-1 as of February 28th, 2023. And I will note that it does say right here in virus total, this may differ from the commercial off the shelf product. The company decides the particular settings which the engine should run in virus total. And this may be a precautionary measure. And as I said, it may be different than our vigilance instance we have of Sentinel-1. But as of right now, Sentinel-1 has not flagged anything. We have no indicators from Sentinel-1, no notices, no tickets. And we did open investigation with Sentinel-1 after we deleted the file so we could start digging into why they didn't see something and Huntress did. Now, what is this file? FRP is a fast reverse proxy that allows you to expose a local server located behind a NAT or firewall to the internet. Sounds like something you really don't want to find in any of your local servers, but hey, it was there. Now this file is available on GitHub, so you can take a look at it yourself. And it was popularized by threat actors. So we'll find and dig into some threat research that talks about that. 
And Huntress doing some background investigation. So we engaged with the Huntress team and they actually said, well, this file looks like it was here on logs we have going back to uh, 22, 12, 18. So that was there quite a while. So this is not a new file that just got created. Getting created and getting detected are two different things. So let's walk through that next. So we do see there was an event data on here and that was shared with us from Huntress. And we're like, okay, this is a little bit more information that they shared with us on this. But then I engaged with Dre and this is at 6.30 in the morning the next day because uh, we've deleted the file. And we can't find any other indicators. We've scanned the systems. We couldn't find any other connections. But you know, the question is now, how did this get there? What happened? And I like that it started out with, I'm sorry, this one has eluded us. That just shows that even though Huntress is still the only one who has found this file, um, that's a really, I don't know, just a good sign at the beginning because they're like, hey, we should have found this sooner. Um, and it just speaks to the way Huntress engages with us and will also engage deeply on this topic with me. And I said, hey, since this file was there before, what made it trigger the investigation? And at 6.33 a.m., Trey answers, I believe we pushed a non-System32 detector to look the file wide, but let me confirm with our detection team to see what prompts us to look. And from the detection team, we have a detector for commonly used names outside of System32, but WinLogin wasn't one. Uh, then we added WinLogin to start to detect things like in Tom's case here. So I really good response. So 6.33 a.m. to 10.33 a.m. to get a relatively concise response. As I said, we've already deleted the threat. We're not seeing any more triggers, any more indicators. We're all on high alert watching things. We're engaging with the client on this and letting them know we're, we're trying to find the source of this. But with the limited visibility we have, we're doing everything within the power we can. But I have a good answer from Huntress. Now let's dive deeper into the research side of this. And Huntress sent me these links. I also did some Googling myself, but these are really good articles here. Threat research from June 2022 from Deep Instinct. Everything, as I said, is linked down below. And FRPC stands for Fast Reverse Proxy Client. The downloaded FRPC is configured to connect yet another attacker controlled server, creating a tunnel between the attacker and the compromised system. So this is a report that shows that this file was in use back in June of 2022 in this. Now we have the Threat Highlights Report from WIS Secure, May of 2022. And fast reverse proxy client and gaining remote access to their victim systems, then going on to enumerate wider network and laterally moving before deploying BitLocker as a form of ransomware. And in a usual step, the attackers also are sending their ransom notes to a local printer, which I highlighted because I thought was kind of funny. And once again, this is that tool being used. It's not that a tool is anything more than a tool, but it does show that it's a popular tool amongst threat actors to enumerate the network, to move laterally, to create a series of connections because they want to identify anything you're going to do to stop whatever their plan is. Usually that plan is going to be ransomware, but they may want to disable backups, but they want to also maintain a persistence. So, well, they can stop you from stopping them, essentially, though this is a big indicator compromise has been documented several times. This has also been documented by Florian Roth. They have the Loki and Thor scanner signatures. This is publicly available and Florian Roth do follow great security researcher, easy to uh, follow on the different socials. This indicator is back updated all the way from 2022, 11.3. So we have all the way back in November of 2022 detect FRP fast reverse proxy tool often used by threat groups. So we've got a lot of research that we compiled to really send over to Sentinel-1 to let them know, hey, why didn't you trigger on this? Now, one of the things I did as well, this is the Sentinel-1 deep visibility system that allows us to take the SHA-1 of that particular FRPC and figure out how they see it or if they see it with the Sentinel-1 or was it somehow blinded? Turns out Sentinel-1 was not blind to this. I was able to use their tool to see this and the connections it was making. So yes, indeed, it is a reverse proxy, source IP and Destination IP are the same because it's proxying the connections. Now, I couldn't find any indicator that there was any external IPs used or there was another connection that spawned off of this that showed me another connection. And we'll get later that, yes, they can see not just internal connections, but external ones. But it's looping back to 3389 from these other ports. This could be because of there was one more component or another tool missing where this was a tunnel that was created. So we're seeing these tunnels and don't have any more information because we can't look through the firewall log and dive into the networking to say, where were these going? But we couldn't 
C through Sentinel-1 anything related to external access from here, or that it was actually accessing and connecting to, or just binding to the port 3389. So I thought this was interesting that we had this here, but um, there's not much else I have besides that. But definitely Sentinel-1 can see these TCP connections and can see this tool running. So this was in their deep, in, deep visibility. So we sent this information over to Sentinel-1. And regarding the hash, this was how they replied to us. We sent it, and it's February 13th. They responded February 14th. So we opened a ticket the next day, Monday, February 14th. We have the response regarding the hash. It is considered riskware and was not deemed fully malicious based on your reputation. But then they go on further. Initiated a new scan and increased reputation. Would expect reputation detection in the future. I globally blacklisted the S1 cloud in the meantime. So if that file is found again, it will be flagged. Now, once again, this is internally their cloud versus I don't know how they provide it to virus total, but this file is now blacklisted in the cloud instance that manages our systems. And we did search all all throughout our systems and all their client systems, I should say, with Sentinel-1, because you can search just for the hash. We did only find this in this particular client's network on a singular server. for, um, So it hasn't appeared anywhere else and no other indicators, and that directory hasn't come back since we removed it. Moving further, and this goes all the way to February 21st, because we sent them the evidence going, well, your behavior analytics should have picked this up. That was our statement we made to them. And this is the response Sentinel-1 had that took about till February 21st. Heard back from Sentinel-1, they said the following, the agent is not designed to monitor or detect traffic opening TCP sockets. It is possible the file was dropped on endpoint prior to installation, uh, but cannot confirm since file events are seen only deletion February 12th and retention only goes through January 14th. So they didn't really acknowledge much on there. They see me delete the file. They were able to identify it's strange because they identified it that morning of running and I actually don't see it in Sentinel-1's logs running prior to that and creating those TCP connections, but still they never flagged it. We did delete it. Now, I want to show you what a Sentinel-1 false positive looks like. Now, back to us having vigilance. So they investigate these false positives, but they absolutely can trace all the connectivity. I bring it up with Screen Connect because, well, we use Screen Connect. We connect to our clients with it. And when there's updates or changes, or sometimes when we're modifying something using Screen Connect in our system, it can absolutely behave like someone doing something nefarious. So they flag this, and this is like the quote graphic, um, how I can walk through the processes. I can walk through and I've blurred this out, but you see this is a behavioral indicator. So this is there why we flagged it. We show the network connection. So absolutely, when there's an external connection, I can dive into the Sentinel-1 deep visibility and see this. I can see it in post after uh, they've done the flagging themselves with their team working on it. And this was the notes on this particular incident. It's happened afterwards on February 17th, 2023 on our Screen Connect client where it says vigilance mitigated false positive action taken unquarantine resolve comment mitigated threat verified as false positive in order to prevent excessive entries in your allow list vigilance will not yet exclude this detection but may reconsider in matching events so this is what a false positive looks like i can show you that they have all that visibility into the things and their behavioral analytics does get things wrong which is part of the reason we use their team to help us sort these out so they can get sorted faster with less pressure on my internal team for this. But we've dealt with this before. We've been using Sentinel-1 for a little while. Now, some of you may ask why I'm using two products that seem to overlap with each other on a Venn diagram. Everything we do to secure things before an incident seems alarmist, but if there's an incident, everything we did before will just seem inadequate. Defense in depth, that term gets thrown out there a lot, and it, as it should with security, I believe having two of these gives me a better sense of having a good picture of what's going on, but it is tricky doing security. This is not an easy task to do at all. In conclusion, due to lack of visibility, we still don't know how the file got there. Our best guess right now is that it's a failed install of some type, but we have read no other indicators on that server or any other servers of the clients that we monitor that there's been any further potential compromise. Next, security is complex and threat actors are ever evolving their tradecraft in clever ways. I say it like that because this is where I don't think AI beats out people. Tradecraft encompasses the overall, the way and methodologies that this is done. The people at Huntress, the teams there spend a lot of time engaging with the greater security community, sharing their own intel and also having this intel at the ready. So when they examine something, they have a large team of people internally and externally in the community that they can engage with to understand the threat landscape and how it changes. 
Threat actors are very clever. They are often looking for new and interesting ways to get into systems because they're very financially motivated. So you have to stay engaged with that community, look at what's going on, talk to your peers. And Huntress has really proven again and again to be a team player on that space. They are huge at giving out a ton of information, whether you're a client or them or not. They publicly post a lot on their blog and they stay engaged and you can follow some of the threat researchers that work there. Maybe they'll tweet things and have these discussions because they want to understand what needs to be modified and what's going on in the world of security so they can keep tuning the tools they use to do the better job of doing it such as the adjustment that led to this getting flagged. Next, your business is not too small to be attacked. It's just probably too small for it to make the news. This is a company with an internal IT team, but honestly, a company even with a thousand people may not even make the news if they go out of business. And often some type of security incident does lead not the day of the incident or even a week after the incident to a company going out of business. This is because it sets off a domino effect, a chain reaction of events. When a security incident costs a lot of money, that money has to come from somewhere. A business may get a loan. That loan may be something that puts extra burden on a business, but they're able to sustain longer and then they may close. This is something I want people to really consider. These events are very damaging, but it's damaging especially to small businesses that may not be as well equipped or have as much sophistication to mitigate these issues. And it's just not going to be newsworthy other than maybe some local paper pointing out that a small manufacturing company with a thousand people went out of business. And this could still be, as I said, a long time after the event, if they were to get some cash infusion to keep them going. All right. That's all I have to say. Leave your thoughts and comments down below. Head over to my forums for a more engaging discussion. Let me know what you think about this. I'm curious to hear the community's thoughts. Am I being too harsh on Sentinel-1 and their behavioral analytics? Should it have picked this up because it's a TCP connection? I don't know. I just want to throw this out there to show that this is a very tricky topic. It's Security is very hard. It's a lot more than just detecting a file or seeing something. There's a lot of complexity to it. Um, let me know if you want to see me do some more videos like this because these deep dives are kind of fun, but I will admit they're also kind of challenging to put together because you have to be very concise on it. All right, and thanks.